under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda this evening, Dr. Andrew? No, we don't. Okay. Seeing none, we will start with 5.0, new business. We have 5.1, minutes of October 2nd, 2014. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions, comments, deletions? Seeing none, all in favor of approval as presented. Seven plus two, so moved. Next we have 5.2, we have uh, I will turn that over to Dr. Antwerp. Uh You have middle school co-curricular appointments. Um, I believe that I may be asked, are these all of them? So I've already <laughs> asked the question, <laughs> Mr. Chiazzo, and the answer is yes. Um, I checked with Barbara Hathaway, so I'm not making up that answer. I'm getting it right from the source. So as presented. Okay. The will of the board? Move approval. Second. Any questions, comments? Thank you, Dr. Rentwistle, for your clarification. Welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Much appreciated. I have a question about Wentworth. We haven't seen, have we seen Wentworth club since? No, I believe that they were not. And we're I think the explanation club was okay. no clubs right now because they're still trying to get trying into to get the building, everything, everything acclimated, settled. settled, and then they would be having them, them sometime next, next time in the next okay. short period of time here. All right, so all in favor of approval as presented. Seven. Thank you very much. So moved. Next, we'll move into our workshop agenda. And we have 6.1. We have the information on the proposed ice hockey rink update. And I'll turn that over to Dr. Antoine. Yes, I, I just think that um, it's important for the board to be kept um, up to date on uh, the, the school's perspective on the proposed hockey rink. And um, so Mr. Legage uh, thought that there was information that would be helpful at least for the board to have. Um, you are not, as you know, taking, at least as far as I know, taking any action or moving towards a position on that right now. Uh, but it is important um, that we and, uh, and Mike uh, really has um, the, the closest connection uh, keep you apprised of the kinds of things that um, we think are important for you to know. Um, thank you, Dr. The, uh I don't know if everybody received their packet, but I put together the hockey group's packet for you. Um, it's missing some uh, artist drawings of the facility, but it has uh, it has a couple on the front there that you can look at. Um, my understanding of where things are at right now is, I believe, last night at town council meeting, they were supposed to talk about. Um, whether they're going to allow some town property to be used for the rink. And they're thinking of a couple of locations um, that would be close by to the school campus. And I don't know the results of that. Maybe somebody here does. I don't know the results of that meeting last night. So the uh -huh. decision to continue to move forward. They okay. under Notice of memorandum. Memorandum of understanding. Thank you. Yeah. And that it's good. They, uh, um, I believe that that said it would be on the campus yes. someplace. They're going to keep looking for a place, not necessarily their original spot, but someplace on the campus. They agree that that was ideal. Yeah, there are two locations they are looking at. Um, so I don't know. They look pairs that they haven't decided on which one. So um, I think the benefit to our students um, in our program is. In terms of the hockey program, it's certainly going to allow us to have some ideal ice time. Um, right now, that hasn't been the case, unfortunately. We've done the best we can to secure ice at various places, but it's really not been an ideal situation for our, for our kids. Um, most practices are 5.30 a.m. Um, that will continue this year. Uh, and We've even had to relocate some of our, our games to another facility. So um, it's really actually gotten worse this year than it's, than it's been in the past um, in terms of ice time. I think the other thing is going to be convenience because it's on the campus or close or will be close to the campus or in the town. I think that it's less travel. Um, 
it's, there's more opportunities for home games. There's more opportunities to host tournaments. So last year we had a total of 56 games in hockey, 24 of which were home. I think that number will likely, the home games could likely increase based on um, whether we host uh, preseason games and some tournaments as opposed to traveling to them as we've been in the past. Um, so we'd be looking at a little bit less expense in transportation. Um, I think the locker room situation for our kids where they don't have to lug their equipment every place. And if you've seen a hockey bag, it's, it's, um, it takes a little effort to maneuver that around every place. I think our uh, athletic trainer, um, they're looking at having an athletic training room there, so we're hoping that he would be able to keep some items there and avoid some of the carry back and forth of his gear as well. I think in, in terms of revenue for us, we would be looking at um, probably hosting some tournaments, maybe some game fees. We'd look at a, being a host site for MPA events we could, maybe some merchandise sales. I, we haven't talked about how concession would work, but there's some revenue streams that are possible um, with having a, a facility on our campus. Um, of course, we'd be renting the facility um, because it wouldn't be owned by us, but <coughs> I think being in Scarborough and having the relationship that we'll have, I think it will provide us some opportunities for um, a revenue source. I think some other things would be um, we could look at some intramural programming around that facility. If it was on campus, we could even look at maybe incorporating that into our physical education program. Um, certainly off-season usage when the ice is out, uh, we'd be looking at um, that facility for spring and fall program opportunities like batting cages or indoor lacrosse or tennis or um, even some of our fall programs being indoors depending on when they're planning on putting the ice in and out. But that would afford us an opportunity for some savings in our budget because right now with tennis and lacrosse, we oftentimes will rent indoor facilities on inclement weather days or um, those sorts of things. So um, I, think, I think it also affords us an op opportunity in terms of culture and climate for um, maybe to, if it was near our campus, to move our spirit assemblies to that facility if it was out, out of ice time um, because it would just be a larger indoor space for us to use. So. I think those are, in a nutshell, some of the some of the benefits to us, and certainly the partnership with this um, this this group that uh, is working really diligently to provide this wonderful space for our for our students. Questions? Hi. So um, you were talking just a second ago about the use of it in the non-ice time. Yes. Will that be available also to the other two towns to use it likewise, or would there be some special arrangement? That would be up to that would be up to the people that manage the rank. I know that what I would be looking for is I would be looking for doing doing pro Scarborough programs um, and going there first as opposed to going to rent a space someplace. Right. We'd probably still have to pay for that. Like we're mm -hmm. going to have to pay for ice still because they have mm -hmm. to function. Mm -hmm. You know, that building has to right. make money so that they can keep it open. So um, we're still going to have to pay for ICE. We're still going to have to pay to rent the facility, but I think it would be a much better relationship than some of the places that we have relationships with now. We certainly pay top dollar to use indoor tennis facilities, for example, mm -hmm. indoor lacrosse facilities, I mean, because that's what they're charging us. Mm -hmm. So. Do, have you got any sense, uh, they probably haven't gotten to that point yet, uh -huh. of, of, you know, might they just start charging what all the rest of the places charge anyways that, that, to make the kind of money they want to make? I think, in, I think in terms of the ice, I think it's going to be comparable to other rinks. I think they have to charge that to, to and, and I don't think that we should think that they're not going to charge that mm -hmm. because I think that that would be unreasonable. Um, they have to they have to run their facility. They have to keep the doors open, and it's expensive to do that. And so I think it would be un unreasonable to think that there wouldn't be a fee for that. I'm hoping in the, in the off season, as they think about that, there would be some savings for us. And one last question would be: um, 
Will it be exclusively to these three towns, or is there anything in there that might leave an opening for them to say, well, we're going to include uh, uh, Westbrook in on it? Now? I don't know what their plans are because that's they're running that business. Mm -hmm. But if it was me running that business, I would always keep the doors open open okay. to any opportunity because oh, okay. they they have to be able to keep their doors open. Okay. And so what you know, they have to plan. What happens if Scarborough doesn't have hockey anymore? Okay. <clears throat> you know, so I think that um, if it was if it was me running that facility I would keep all my options open. But that's really their issue, not our issue to okay. deal with how they manage that facility. Mm -hmm. okay. else? Michael what? I, don't, I haven't seen anything that, that indicates seating capacity for the rink. I don't know what they're looking at for seating capacity. My understanding is that it's going to be close to like a Falmouth or USM type of thing where seating would be on one side um, and it would be the ice rink would be down. So as you enter the facility, like if you're looking on that front page of this, mm -hmm. as you enter that facility, you'd enter it in the, at the top level and then walk down to your seating and walk down to the ice. So kind of like a Falmouth USM kind of concept. So I think they're looking at that type of seating. So that's why they're looking at a gradual incline for... I think if they found the right piece of property and they could reduce their... I would think this. I don't know this and I haven't had any discussions with anybody about this. This is my own personal opinion, I would say if they found the right facility to reduce the construction costs, then I, I would do that. But I, I haven't had any conversations with them about that. What is the second location on campus that they're looking at? I know obviously the one up on 114 next to the high school. What, what, was, what is the other location? Where the tennis and basketball courts are located. By the library. Right. I hope so, because we would need tennis courts <laughs> for our spring programs, but I don't know that. That's now, I haven't been part of I haven't been part of those conversations. That kind of brings up my question. Um, a couple questions, obviously, clearly. Um, mm -hmm. This seems to be a town focused, town council focused kind of project. Have we been approached at all in terms of input of our, our input of where the campus it might be, or do we have a say, or uh, are we being consulted in terms of is it better to be by the high school, is it better to be out back, are we involved in that, or are we kind of sitting on the sidelines and it's beyond our jurisdiction, if you will, or control? I don't feel like we're sitting on the sidelines. Okay. I think that um, that group had a very early meeting that Dr. Entwistle and I were involved in and, and talked to um, him and I about location and and um, that, that was more of a kind of a fact-finding kind of meeting where we were talking about what happens if we put it here, how would that impact the facility, that, those sorts of types of questions. Um, certainly, we're, we've, I feel we've been very supportive of it being on campus someplace, but um, I don't think those are our decisions to make. Um, I think those are town decisions. Um, I would... I. I, but I don't feel like we've been left out of those discussions. I feel like we've been part of part of them. With them or with the council or both? We haven't. We, I haven't sat in with the town council, but I've certainly sat in with the, the, the friends of Scarborough Hockey Group. Okay. I mean, I, I would like to know. I mean, if we have concerns with traffic flow, with interruption of the campus, I would hope yeah. we would have an opportunity to convey those or yeah. work with the council to uh, discuss placement before that happens. Uh, I don't know if that's if that's well, one thing an opportunity I, or not. One thing I thought was if they suddenly decide it's going to go where the basketball or the tennis courts are, mm -hmm. then where are those relocated to and who's bearing the burden right. of the mm -hmm. financial end of moving those elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I mean, I granted, I mean, putting up a basketball court is mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, outrageously mm -hmm. pricey, mm -hmm. but I don't know that. What needs to be put in for fill or excavation, yeah. and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And so I would be, oh. that would be a concern of mine. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the safety of of our of our students and and other students coming to visit here. So that's um, been a, that's been that was that's, that's what I expressed to mm -hmm. um, the the. 
two people that I see as the, the key folks that I've stayed in contact with. I've had other other individuals, presumably part of that group, soliciting, you know, uh, my input, and I chose to go back to Mr. Murray because he's the one that established the contact with Mike and I. So I use him as the spokesperson, and I've expressed not that I don't believe that there are ways to appropriately mitigate the risk in terms of, of traffic flow uh, because I'm not a traffic expert, but that is the one that is the one thing that worries me, and I think it worries all of us, that that needs to be a top priority in terms of the planning so that um, we don't have um, what ends up being a very large number of inexperienced drivers from Scarborough and elsewhere uh, all converging in, in the same spot at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that, and, um, and that was pleasantly received and so noted and, um, and there will be time, I guess, uh, in, the, um, in the plan design phase to, to really look at that. They first have to figure out which location is going to be, um, might, you know, might be viable, I guess. And, and that's going to be determined, if I understand correctly, through the council and them. That's correct. I, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the, the meeting that Dr. Rentwistle and I were in, I think this has just been a great partnership um, to this point. So I think that the Friends of Skyro Hockey Group have been very willing to listen to um, what we've shared. I think in our first meeting that Dr. Rentwistle and I had with them, they were, um, I think we really detailed out those concerns related to traffic and student safety in the parking lot and and everybody was very receptive to mm -hmm. that and understood that and know that that needs to be part of the plan and so I would say that um, that um, we would uh, I mean I don't know how the traffic patterns were figured out with the Wentworth project and then putting the islands where they put them and those mm -hmm. things so I would think that it would be that same level of relationship and whether that was nothing at all or whether that was a hundred percent involvement I, I might use that as a as a um, barometer of what the relationship may be um, moving forward with this sort of project yeah and I don't I don't have any concerns with the communication with Bosch I and mean, I think they've been very proactive in trying to get um, endorsement and encouragement in the community uh, to be frank, my concern is on the council side that they'll make a decision without input from us and we'll get stuck with it. Um, and I, I, I'm, I would be uh, very hopeful and um, stay abreast of the fact that we need to be involved in, at some level, at least being consulted on the impact it's going to have on the rest of the campus. So, At, the, at this point, the, consul the only consultation I've been asked by the town is the savings to any savings there would be to the hockey program and I provided that information to them because I think that that I think that that was a question by one of the town councilors and so um, uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Gulliver who were part of that were seeking some input from me about financial things and so I provided them some information related to that. Um, do you see a need to invest in any additional equipment for the off-season use, like let's say batting cages or something? You, would you be asking the Fosh Group to install that infrastructure and we would then be basically just instead of leasing it from one organization, we'd lease the space from another or would we say we'd like the open space and we'll have uh, our own equipment that we bring in or something like that? I don't know what the relationship would be. I mean, if you were to ask me right now, I think my initial, without any thought into it, reaction would be that I would rather have the open space and then we would do what we want with it because it would allow us more flexibility with a variety of teams and programs. But um, I would have to be thought more thoughtful about my answer to that question. But my, without any thought into it, I would rather have the open space and to do what I want to do with it. And do you think, um, I'm not sure what the town's intention is for the lease. I know there's been questions about uh -huh. negotiation in terms of it's a low-cost lease, what's the benefit to the town, things like that. Do you foresee or can you imagine any type of involvement in if we're going to be involved as a town, leasing the space or giving them a low-cost 
least that there would be some kind of added benefit brought to the school department? Mm -hmm. Or do you see that being more of a some kind of town benefit on the community services side of things? Well, I think first of all, under the law, they cannot build on what is considered school land without the school board's permission. In other words, uh, if, if we stopped using uh, a school building today, the town cannot do anything with that school building until we say that we have no, we no longer need that for educational purposes and we turn it over to the town. So it seems to me if they were going to uh, build the rink as proposed originally on you know, part of the parking lot, then the school board would have to turn that land over to the town so that the town could use that land uh, for other purposes. So we do have, under the law, is my understanding, that, that we do have that <coughs> control. So right, but I understand it's a municipal campus, so if it goes into a place like the basketball courts and the tennis courts, uh, is that all considered a school property? Is that no, considered municipal property? the town built those right. okay. on reclaimed land right. okay. and so got fined for it. So I wouldn't build anything there, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I'm but, serious. Yeah. But to the point, though, I mean, I think it sounds like from what I heard in the October workshop meeting, and I didn't see last night's, but it sounds like the location that they originally proposed was a, was a non-starter for a lot of people and that a lot of counselors, and I think that got moved. So they're looking at, yes, other spaces on the municipal campus, but again, I would, I would be concerned in terms of the issues that were raised, like tra traffic flow, how do we deal with buses in the morning? Um, if, we're, if we've got traffic flow after it's built of people going there on a regular basis, are they going to cut through the campus? Are we going to have access? How are we going to do those things? And I would hope, uh, I would expect, but at the minimum, I would hope we would have some consultation from the town on that before it. Maybe not the say, maybe not the uh, authority to approve it, but at least some discussions on how it might impact us. Let me, let me, if I could just clarify, because I just want to be really clear that um, the two sites that I mentioned w was information that I received, not anything that was official. It was right. in discussion. Dr. Antwistle was part of some of those discussions, but um, they could be very well thinking of someplace else. But what was what? I was aware of were those two locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It may not be either of those locations, I don't know, yeah. but that's what I was made aware of. Yeah. Well, last night at the meeting, they discussed the possibility of um, eight different locations on Great. the municipal okay. campus. On municipal, yeah. on the on campus? Mm -hmm. So there are that were large enough? Eight, so we'll say seven. That are large, <laughs> enough, <laughs> that are large enough to put this. Yeah. The actual building one itself isn't Yeah, it's big. not big. It's yeah. just like a sheet of ice and some lock room. It's simplified a lot, but it's not extremely extremely It's not, yeah, it's not a huge structure. We're not talking Because they were talking about even next to the outdoor right. ice rink. Right. Yeah. That there is enough space there that they could put it there. Well, doesn't it make sense that either mm -hmm. the chair or a couple of us or Dr. Entwistle, somebody approaches Tom Hall to uh, you know, give some input, ask to be involved in, in the discussions just so we have some idea of moving forward of, of what the town is thinking. I'm, I, I don't even know. I'm guessing this would go out to a, a vote in the town, and that probably, I don't know if that's the case, but any other kind of facility like this has usually gone into a vote. Um, I wouldn't think it's a if they're not spending yeah. any money. money. Yeah. 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 I would hope that they were are able to use something adjacent to one of our parking lots. I would hate to have to pave more land in town. And that's why I think, uh, I have said right from the beginning, if this project goes forward, I think it should be as close to the high school and the parking areas as we can conceivably make it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, for both for the benefit of the students and for the convenience of people coming to games. We have plenty of parking. The only time the parking lots are ever full is the day that we had graduation outside. Right. <laughs> Truly. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the day after Thanksgiving where there's a basketball tournament going on and we have the 
We have the craft fair going on at the high school. Uh, that parking lot has never, ever been well, built. In wintertime, it's pretty It gets pretty full. Well, it does because of the snow well. pieces. And yeah, you're yeah. right, we lose parking spaces. <coughs> but yeah. it, I've never seen it completely filled. So are there any other questions? Or then I would look to Dr. Entwistle and ask if he would be willing. James. Oh, sorry, Jane. I didn't see your hand up over there. Jane, did you have your hand up? Yes, I was going to ask. Uh, oh, Mike. sure. Okay. Absolutely. Have you ever had heard of this kind of partnership that a non-profit, non-profit partnership with the, any of the school around here for any kind of extracurricular program that we have to pay them and be successfully run? Have you ever had this kind of heard of the such arrangement? Falmouth has a similar situation. Yeah. Um, Bideford has a similar situation. Um, the Bideford Ice Arena is actually owned by the municipality. Um, and Falmouth has a similar sort of situation too where um, there's a private group that manages the Falmouth rink but there's a um, similar sort of connectedness to the municipality and to the school department. Um, North Yarmouth Academy certainly has their own ICER rink but manages it independently. Um, Bridgeton Academy certainly has their own ice rink, manages it independently. There are many examples of this kind of relationship. So and I think and this group has reached out to those groups to learn from those experiences. And um, you know, this is not money to reach five million dollars I imagine it's around the community here. Do you foresee any kind of because this draining donation out of uh, any other program in town, extracurriculum or whatever? Um, because we have to get that much money for this single program? No, I think that those, I think the three communities are going to be resources, and I think our business owners in our town already feel tapped because um, of a, sh you know, um, how do I say that? Over a budget? Um, we have a shrinking athletic budget. And so, consequently, um, we've relied on parent support groups more and more. And so, I think that the uh, I think that the business owners in town have felt that. But I think also the business owners in town have been very gracious in supporting all our programs, and will be very gracious in supporting this, along with the other three communities that are involved. So, I don't see that. I don't see that money raised for the ice rink is going to drain money from something else. Uh, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay, and since this thing is not you know, managed or owned by the town or any, uh -huh. uh, I mean, the governance of this nonprofit, I mean, we don't have any say to it. How can we be sure someday, you know, you don't perceive savings right now, but if, you know, just nonprofits that you, you have probably heard Salvation Army, the CEO, you know, person pays themselves half a million dollars to run over the nation. And if, how would have we, how are we going to have any control over the government of this program? And say, you know what, when some days the fees go up, and how, how are we going to cope with it? Of course, Chris, if you have this. No, no, I mean, I, I think I can address it because they, they brought that up in the, in the, in the, in the, on the October 4th um, workshop for the council as well, and their intention is to have a, quote unquote board of directors and there will be a member from the school department of each municipality, Scarborough, South Portland, Cape, as well as a member from the town government or if you will or something on the board as well. So, And then collectively that board will manage the facility or not manage it but they'll be the oversight and they'll hire a, a staff person to actually physically manage the facility. Okay, so, so the founders of this organization is not going to be the actual board member. Mm -hmm. They are going to come from the community. Okay, that's Correct. Great. I think they have a they have a fundraising board or, or a project board at this point, and then they'll move into an operational style board once it's finished. Um, so I, I didn't, I didn't, I, I mean, I thought that was fair and equitable. It seemed reasonable. But I, I guess back to the question though about if we're if we're going to be the ones contributing land, I don't know if there's going to be some other benefit that's going to be seen to the town or to the school department. I mean, maybe, maybe. It's wishful thinking, I know, but perhaps we could get a reduction in, a small reduction in our ice time, 
because we're contributing to the land. And I don't know if it's even legally possible to tie that into a lease or something like that, but um, I, I don't know if there's a way to tie a benefit into that because we actually would be the municipality that it would be located in. We would have traffic issues to deal with. We'd have other issues to deal with as well. So I don't know if that's something we can bring to the table or not, but I assume that's something we would bring up with the town council. Or you could, you could solve that question with one call to the city of Portland and see uh, if if the Portland Deering ice team ice hockey teams pay the same rate for the Portland Arena as do other teams. But I think that's different mm -hmm. though because that's a municipal rink. Mm -hmm. The city of Portland owns that rink. That's not a private that's not a that's not a private rink. I understand. What I'm saying is that you could get a feeling mm -hmm. for whether or not a municipality who has input into the construction or owns a part of it or whatever mm -hmm. gives a reduced rate to to their in house team so to speak. My understanding from what um, I've heard in uh, the council meeting last night that I was watching and from the previous meeting, the primary benefit to Scarborough is that our students aren't on the road at 4.30 in the morning driving to a hockey practice half an hour away, 45 minutes away, sure. or you know having practice at 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So the benefit comes directly to the students that participate and to the people in town who would like a nice arena close by and um, I don't want to be outside at the outside. Of the and in fairness, budget. And in fairness the, uh, the I know the lease hasn't been negotiated. They don't know they haven't got terms and conditions or anything like that yet. I've just, I just I, I don't know if that's an option that's on the table. If, if if that's a way to structure that into the lease. If I mean obviously it would be more palatable for us I would think as a board and and easier to get behind a project if we knew there was a more of a financial benefit to us as well. Um, it's certainly be easy for me individually to support something if I knew we were getting more of a financial benefit out of it. But um, it's my um, my feeling anyway from the way it's all come down is that it's not our students would benefit from it, but it's not anything that we need to make an official mm -hmm. vote of support or anything on yeah. because it's yeah. it's a private it's a private yeah. comp you know private group that's going to be owning the building on. Town land, leased yeah. leased by the town, right. yeah. not the school department. So people, I know a lot of people are interested in the school department coming out and endorsing or not, or right. throwing their support behind the project. And I have no problem in, as individuals when we do that, but I don't think as a school board we have a right. direct relationship with the deal at this point. Right. So. Right. Chris, what's the cost of transportation of hockey teams uh, for practice? Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we had about 30000 in the budget the year that we had it. Um, and then last year we did the offset credit to some extent because we couldn't provide the transportation. Was that 30000 for all of ice hockey or? I believe that was, yeah. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but I believe that was the, the whole hockey program, right? Practice and yep. 30000 so uh, is everything. Thank of you. Of course, uh, transportation to practices was cut from the budget exactly. this year. Exactly. But if we had a full budget, um, it would be, I think, for practices around a fifteen thousand dollars savings. But then you have to add the home games now to that if it's in the town. So I think it would be closer to that number. But I think, um, you know, my thirty thousand dollar number that I gave to the town included some cost savings and some revenue possibilities as well as transportation. So. And, and that does bring up a good question too. Has there been any discussion about collection of gate fees, or like you said, I need to concessions are still on the table, or has it been discussed? Um, I mean, I think we're going to benefit directly or indirectly at, at, at any reason, any point. Either either I take the gate for games, or the boosters takes the gate for game. If the boosters takes the gate for games, I get the money back indirectly anyway. So I think whether there's a direct impact or an indirect impact. We're going to benefit from a rink in this town financially. So, host, you know, things that I've already mentioned: hosting tournaments, games fees, merchandise sales. I mean, people, our booster groups are not lugging merchandise to all the rinks that we go to now because it's just too much and too far and too, you know too much yeah. of a hassle. And 
Um, and, and I'm assuming that they would take the concession. Concession is a big part of the income for rinks, but that hasn't been negotiated out yet, so maybe there's an opportunity there, as I mentioned. So I've mentioned some revenue sources already that I think are, are open to us and, and I would think would be on the table to chat about. All right. I think that there's not any, I, mean, I know there's a lot of concern in the community and from what we're hearing from the counselors. I don't think Based on this plan that we've seen and we've heard from them, there's any possibility this building would not succeed as an ice rink and it would not be full and right. profitable mm -hmm. from day one. Mm -hmm. Because Kristen can tell you how hard it is to get ice space is because there are people who want to skate on that ice. Right. Mm -hmm. There are programs that will come from really far distances to use the ice space. Mm -hmm. That's just bringing business to town. So I just think mm -hmm. that there's no way that this is not um, going to be a profitable or an empty building, which I think some people are yeah. worried about. I mean, not in my lifetime, I don't see it being a, an abandoned building next to the high school. I, I wouldn't worry about that either, um, but again, because it's a private entity on on public land and we would have direct a direct effect to it, or it would directly impact us. I, I, if there's an opportunity there to be creative, and I mean, we've got to look at alternative revenue streams. Mm -hmm. We've been saying that since day one. Mm -hmm. Here and if if we can structure an agreement, um, you know, legally structure an agreement and have an opportunity to increase some gate money either to the boosters or to the athletic department as a whole, or the athletic and activities budget as a whole, I think we have to explore that. And and I I'm, I guess the question is, it sounds I, it, it, in my mind, it sounds like it's a two prong approach. We got to talk to Fosh and CA if they're open to that because it sounds. My impression from their business plan is we've got a sheet of ice, we charge, let's say, $275 an hour for the ice. You rent the ice, do with it what you will. We need that $275 for our revenue stream, and we charge everybody the same price. And that's fine, that's great. But the question I would have is are there contracts that the town is going to try from a community services standpoint to do concessions or to run peewee hockey programs and, and get reduced rates for the ice time? Mm. And if they're going to do something like that, then the question becomes, can we get involved early enough to benefit, have the school department and the school programs benefit from that as well? So I guess at this so point, if there aren't any other questions. Well, so we yeah. haven't decided. Is somebody going to approach somebody? I was just going to make that okay. inquiry. So if nobody else has any questions, I would look to Dr. Entwistle and ask him if he would be interested. Not to be <laughs> maybe not interested, it's not the good word, but um, would you be willing to go um, yes. to, to speak to Tom Hall? So by, by consensus of the board, I've been asked to make sure that the board is included or, or the, the chair is included in, um, in, in these discussions as it may impact the schools. Mm -hmm. And if, again, I'd be happy to volunteer from from the revenue side of things as well because we we've, we've been tasked with looking at different in okay. finance, looking at different revenue streams, and this could be one of those instances. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and once it gets the the okay on the go from the town, then you know, is it possible for either a school board member or Mike to? have a voice at the table in what Scarborough's school system's responsibility or, you know, so that we're, we're sitting there when the discussions come up that you're talking about. So having a seat at the table, basically. I, I, yeah, I think that would be, you know, maybe not a, obviously not a controlling seat, but at least have some input in the discussion to be consulted on, on what has to go forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair and reasonable. I will do, maybe I I will do that. Thank you. I can't see you sitting there and not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're next to me, Jackie. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for that Thank presentation you. and that you. lively, engaged conversation over that. We appreciate it. Thank you for your update. So um, next on our agenda this evening, we have 6.2. <laughs> we have our curriculum update. And I would turn that over to Dr. Entwistle to start maybe with an introduction. Yes. Um, well, tonight we're going to hear uh, from Monique. This is, again, um, an effort to keep the board apprised and to address some of the um, topics that the board was interested in uh, hearing about when you generated um, ideas for workshops. Um, Monique is uh, yeah. going to give you an, an update in all of the content areas, um, the progress being made, and um, I think she's also got a nice little piece 
um, that she will wrap up with, um, which is, I think, uh, if I remember, Ms. Lang uh, was the one who suggested that, that we get to see a profile of each of the phases and really where we are in terms of uh, where we want to be. Are we where we want to be in terms of these content areas in each of the phases? And it gives you a, a nice vision to really look at. Monique has done a nice job, so I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. I'd like to begin by uh, doing a little bit of, providing a little bit of information about what curriculum now looks like in this 21st century. Uh, as I've been doing this for a little bit of time, we used to have a very uh, uniform, predictive curriculum review cycle, and it was generally based on the fact that most textbook theories including all of the um, manipulatives and things that go along with that, we're on a 10-year curriculum cycle. That shifted, given technologies, that shifted to about every five years. So across eight content areas, we certainly weren't able to keep up. And then it became um, every three years or so. And now it can be annually, if not um, monthly, depending on what you are purchasing. And part of that is because curriculum materials have changed. Uh, it's not as simple as bringing a committee together, going through the materials, developing our criteria, choosing a textbook, you order them, they arrive, you put a Scarborough School Department stamp on them, you hand them out, you do a training, <laughs> and you move forward. Now it looks more like yeah. online subscriptions, software applications, all kinds of technologies, computing devices, as well as probeware, software, uh, to provide students online access to experiences, videos. So it requires some supportive resources that were, are, are beyond stamping a textbook. It requires staffing that knows how to um, draw student information from our student information system, staffing who can learn that new application, enter those students in that new application, and then every year, the work that the students do, they need to follow the students over time. And so rolling those students up every year. We have about 61 of those applications, and we are maximized with, some of them are instructional, some of them are assessments. We're pretty well maximized with keeping up with those systems and processes. In addition to the inventory of print-based text, materials and other supplies that go along with uh, curriculum materials. The good news in all of this is what we're able to offer the students far exceeds what we were able to offer them with a large, heavy textbook. So some of those new learning opportunities include what you call distance learning. And distance learning, the simple way to describe distance learning because it often means a whole lot of different things. It's learning that takes place when the students are in a different physical space than the teacher or the learning experience. So for example, some of our students who will sit in a classroom, they may be presented with some real-time event that's happening in another part of the world. That is distance learning because the learning experience is happening elsewhere. It could be that a teacher or another class is in a different part of the world. It could be an <coughs> online course, much of which you hear about in terms of accessing college courses or learning experiences for students. So even teachers who use websites that provide activities or post their homework or assignments online or what we call web quests, um, where students can go home and take part in that, that can be considered online learning or distance learning as well. What the research is showing us is the best case scenario is some sort of blended opportunity where the teachers and the class do come together for a portion of the time as well as there be a different, a, the teacher in a different spot. We also have synchronous and asynchronous. Sometimes the learning takes place at the same time. Sometimes a student can log on at 11 o'clock at night and do their work. Uh, we ha offer at the high school, virtual high school courses for juniors and seniors who can't access, or if there are courses we don't offer at Scarborough High School, they can access those courses through the virtual high school. 
We also, for an online option, we have a credit recovery option through the Adult Ed Program. Uh, Mrs. Sizemore could probably speak more about that, but we use Compass Learning, which is an online, uh, provides online content to students so that they can make up those credits over the course of the summer so that they can stay on the same pathway and not be behind. We had Rosetta Stone at our 3-5 where students were receiving Chinese as well as Spanish, and that was an online learning application in which students could log on and practice at home. That, as you know, because of our reduction um, over the past few years, um, has disappeared. And as we're rebuilding our programs, we're going to continue to look at that as well as some other blended learning opportunities for our students. In terms of advanced learning opportunities, our students at Scarborough High School can access college coursework. We have a couple different opportunities for students. We have Early College for Maine, for ME, and Early Aspirations. The Early College for Me program is through the community colleges. The Early Aspirations is through USM. Uh, the Early College for Me is really designed for students who um, are doing well, but that they may need some transitional support in terms of managing the financial aid process, study skills, those sorts of things. So it's students would, in addition to their high school schedule, go to one of the community colleges and take a college course, but they would also work with a mentor within a program um, to help them with that process. Early aspirations through USM, again, it is called, referred to as dual enrollment program where a student can take a college course as well as their coursework at Scarborough High School. Uh, on course for college is a main community college program as well, uh, and that is where a student can take a course at our, one of our main community colleges in addition to their coursework. And again, they need to go to the um, community college to take that course. Academy is through UMaine, and that is an online student. There's a selection of courses, and students would take um, college-level course offerings online. And again, in addition to the high school coursework, but they wouldn't need to go on, physically go on campus. Uh, what I'd like to talk about are the content areas as well, um, and giving you a little bit of an update of where we are with things. Uh, K-5, as you know, um, through the uh, resources, uh, that we have. We are implementing a new writing curriculum, K-5. It's called the Units of Study. It was designed out of Teachers College of New York. It's a workshop model. Uh, we are, have been very, very busy. As a matter of fact, today our consultant came back and worked with our uh, specialists, art, music, PE, support staff, so they understand the framework of the writing process, or this new model, and they um, have now develop some strategies to help support writing. Uh, we had summer, intensive summer professional development for classroom teachers, and over the next couple weeks, our consultant is coming back to model lessons in the classroom. Teachers can observe those lessons and ask questions. They'll also be planning the next instructional unit, and that will be ongoing over the course of the year. We'll have those consultants back, or teachers can volunteer to model a classroom lesson as well. K2, our K2 teachers also wanted to work on their foundations, what's called foundations portion of their language arts. That's the phonemic awareness, the phonics, right up through the spelling. Our hope um, is next year that the 3-5 teachers will also take on this piece. In addition to, um, in the plan, the recommended plan, pending budget approval will be for to expand to the reading portion of this, the reading workshop model. K-8, teachers are working on a revised curriculum based on their framework. They're in the second to summer and the third year of that. That's moving along well. With the restructuring that took place at the middle school, teachers have time during the day to work on their units and their lessons. 9-12, our teachers at the high school are working on Fine Tune, which is an online experience, professional development experience for them, so that they can calibrate their writing. Students take an online assessment and that's the assessments 21, and then teachers online calibrate and then score those that writing. They get together to look at that data and share strategies. So we're continuing <coughs> to support teachers with summer workshop and planning time. In the area of mathematics, K-5, we're in the fourth year of implementation of the Math in Focus, the Singapore approach. We have family math nights going on. Our instructional coaches are developing volunteer training. 
They're looking at assessment practices and differentiation from students. So we're really tuning that at the K-5. 6 through 8, 9 through 12, we're in the second year of a mathematics uh, implementation. And they're focusing on the common assessments. How do we know students are learning and looking at the data there? So the ongoing training and support, for example, this summer we were able to bring in a national consultant from West Ed who worked with both the high school and middle school teachers together. So they were able to have conversations cross phase level but also learn from a national expert. During the year they have grade level meetings and they're providing students with some flexible groups so that they are skill appropriate and then our instructional coaches are in classrooms modeling. Word languages and the arts, we're in a rebuilding year. Uh, the additional staffing at the middle school has created a much stronger team. They're working on their instructional units and they're exploring effective methods of delivery to maximize learning, specifically utilizing the laptops that they have. Uh, at the elementary, we're exploring some ideas. We're looking at the possibility of some blended learning opportunities. Uh, one of which we're looking into either next week or the week after is the Middlebury Interactive Languages. They offer a uh, blended learning opportunity. We're going to be exploring that. Visual and Performing Arts, again, because of the additional staffing, we've been able to strengthen our team of teachers and better deliver um, increased, uh, also increased amount of time, but also um, higher quality uh, arts experiences for our students. Science, Social Studies, Health, PE, and Career Education for exploring and adjusting and piloting in those areas. Science we're going to focus on. We're going to be bringing a K-12 group together pretty quickly of teachers and leaders. We need to identify a new core. We have a new set of standards, national standards, the next-gen science standards. And there are some new things in there. For example, WAVES and their applications and technologies and information transfer are given our wireless environment that we're in, it, uh, if we're really preparing students, we really need to help them understand what that all is. And also engineering design. I know that's been a topic of conversation, um, but that is actually a standard in the new set of science standards. Uh, we're going to be exploring resources. Um, we're going to be developing recommendations for materials and professional development, and you'll be hearing more about that during budget time. Social Studies Middle School is piloting new um, uh, curriculum through TCI, and again, there's a text print materials, but there is an online um, experience for students um, that they're also using this year. They're piloting that piece. Health Phys Ed, Career and Education Development, we are exploring, we're looking for opportunities, to develop some authentic and relevant learning experiences for our students. For example, a couple of examples. One, as you heard, I think it was last year, I believe Ms. Larry from the high school uh, facilitated a group through Fairchild Semiconductor. Some mm -hmm. students went and did a couple of days where they really, they, they role played uh, and interviews. They worked on some engineering design projects. Uh, so we're trying to uh, expand those opportunities for high school students. Uh, Maine Medical Center, the Research Institute, has held open houses and we've had high school students participating on panels with real scientists involved in research. Uh, Judy Stanhope has made a strong connection uh, with those folks right down the street. And as a matter of fact, we, creeping into the middle school, we have a group of students referred to as the CSI group where the I, our IT staff is volunteering um, their hours to work with these students to um, help them pursue their interests in information technology. Some students are working on coding, some computer science activities, and some students are even accessing online certifications that are real world certifications. Uh, and again, I go back to that, it's my hope that our students graduate from Scarborough High School not with just a transcript, but a re an actual resume um, of real life experiences. So that area of career education and development is one that we are actively pursuing. Uh, and even these little examples are, you know, uh, work for a handful of students at a time, but we, in terms of capacity, we're looking to have all of our students uh, at the high school over 1,000, in the district over 3,000 students experience a strong career education and development opportunities. Um, it would be wonderful if every high school student graduated having had an internship experience in some field or some particular area. 
managing that, coordinating that, making that happen for students uh, is a challenge. We have a limited guidance uh, department, uh, and that is one of the areas. Career education uh, is one of the areas in addition to social-emotional development and academic uh, monitoring um, in the guidance standards. So we're limited there, uh, but we are actively exploring. I mentioned the guiding principles because, as you know, um, that will be an additional graduation requirement in addition to the eight content areas. We're working on building that student-centered learning system. Uh, we're going to be focusing on developing opportunities for students to demonstrate these skills. And again, those examples I just shared are clearly examples um, of these skills. Uh, so it will be part of our planning moving forward, but not just as an exit requirement at the high school, but also at the middle school, at 3-5, and at K-2. So our students K-12 through 12, have a vertically articulated curriculum where they have opportunities to develop these skills. In terms of an assessment and overview, uh, in the eight content areas, let me describe this scale I've put together. Uh, and I could even still adjust this a little bit. I've just come back from a conference. It was a New England conference through um, NEASC in Massachusetts where we listened to school districts in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire in terms of what they offer their students in high schools. Uh, and it was, it just got my competitive juices going. I want to be able to offer some of these experiences for our Scarborough students. Uh, but um, I think we'll continue on with maximizing every resource we have to try and get there. In the area of literacy, uh, I placed a two, adequate but not competitive. We just invested significant resources in moving towards the workshop model in writing. We have yet to uh, move towards that model in reading, and we have yet to move at 3.5 in the foundations area. And uh, I can name half a dozen area school districts who have been doing this stuff for a couple of years now. Uh, at the K level in terms of their writing. At 6-8, we have invested a couple of years in the framework, um, which is a college board program, and that's why I would put that sufficient and competitive with area schools. At 9-12, we offer English all four years. We do not offer many electives. We only offer a couple of AP courses there, and that's why I would rate that as less than adequate. In the area of mathematics, we've been investing over the past few years um, with significant professional development, and that's where I see that as sufficient and competitive with area schools. We've also chosen a curriculum that comes from an international perspective, which I believe will make our students competitive um, in their futures. Science, our science equipment and materials at the K-5, uh, we had a... Uh, Shelf life of about eight years. We're going on 14 or 15 there, so there is a need to replace those materials and bring them up to speed with the new standards. At 6-8, the science folks have been working with the next-gen science standards and are beginning to explore in some of those areas, and they have spent quite a bit of time in their science labs taking those kits and organizing the materials in order to better deliver that authentic, relevant science experience for their kids. 9-12, we struggle to, in the science department, we, and in other departments as well, we struggle to offer students with the courses that we even have in our program of studies. And those classes, I know from my experience a couple of years ago, were over um, 20 students in a science class. They would love to be able to offer more engineering and pre-engineering classes, but we just don't have enough teachers to expand our offerings there. Social Studies K-5 is in significant need of um, new materials. The print resources they are using, I believe the copyright was about 2004, so they're uh, completely outdated. Six, eight Social Studies were invested, they're piloting. It's adequate, but it's going to take a little bit more time before we can. I could say that we're competitive with area schools. And certainly 9-12, given the limited uh, electives we have to offer, um, would be a one. Uh, our schedule, certainly as you've heard before, gets in the way of that. 
but also our, the numbers of staff we have. World languages, as you notice, uh, K2 and 3-5, it does not exist. 6-8, we've been rebuilding, but we, and we're moving world languages towards uh, core status as opposed to specialist, but we still have additional staffing needs there. Uh, at the high school, uh, it is a two, um, mostly because the elimination of the elementary program means that students are unable to access higher level classes. But we <coughs> also, when I chatted with some of these school districts today, they offer Japanese, they offer Chinese, uh, a whole range of courses that we just are unable to offer. Uh, visual and performing arts, we have been rebuilding. Uh, and health PE, those are threes we have um, benefited from lower enrollments there, and staff have been able to offer, maintain the offerings that we've had in the past in those areas. At 6-8, Visual and Performing Arts, and 9-12, we still do not offer near um, the amount of time and the variety of opportunities in uh, performing arts, certainly, but also in visual arts that our area schools offer. Health and PE, likewise, at the high school, uh, we have just enough staffing to make sure that they meet the minimum state requirements in those areas. There are very few electives um, that students are able to take. Career education, again, at the K-5, as we chatted earlier, um, is, does not exist. Um, and then at middle school, there is some. Uh, the guidance staff has been working on that. And certainly at 9-12, there isn't a concerted effort. There are some opportunities we offer students, and there are some conversations that are, um, take place. But in terms of meeting the needs of all kids and providing that um, to all students, um, at this point, it doesn't exist. Are there questions? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not looking at you. I'm going to ask my question first. Okay, so I would like to know how many of our students are dual enrolled because I have had some experience with this now with my daughter being away at school, hearing lots of her friends who were dual enrolled and now have 20 credits and they're starting as a freshman. My understanding, I had a chat this week with um, Ms. Larry, um, is that we have in each of the programs about a handful or so, half dozen to a dozen or so in each program. So under 50 students take part in um, dual enrollment options there. Out of what, 600 juniors and seniors that we have in the Yes. School? Roughly? Yes. Okay. yes. And part of that is, for those courses where students need to be on campus, part of that is our schedule. Um, it is very difficult with all that they are involved in, including athletics in the afternoon, um, as well as the way our schedule is set up, even leaving early because our period six and seven flip-flop, mm -hmm. um, some days they might miss a class. So for those students who leave early, we have a student who is involved in the Portland dance program, and it just worked out. It was luck of the draw in terms of being able to sh do a shift in the schedule so she would not be missing an additional class um, in her ability to leave early. That's one piece that kind of, the other part is transportation. Okay. Is the question on the dual enrollment. Do students need to be recommended for that or is that a student driven I want to do more. If a student wants to go in to have a conversation with the guidance council, each of those programs has certain um, um, requirements. For example, um, I believe the USM piece, the aspirations, has a, you know, a B average or better. Um, it, it, there are certain recommendations. The um, College for Maine, that is based only on a recommendation. So the guidance department screens all, um, and that's for seniors, screens all seniors to look at seniors who may be first generation college um, um, ready. Uh, they may look at um, other factors as well in terms of aspirations, and so they identify and recommend students <coughs> for that program. All right, so now, now that I got to ask my question, thank you. Jackie? Uh, to follow up on, on what we were just discussing and the questions, I disagree with with the way we're handling it in that 
there needs to be recommendations or, or qualifications because if we're looking to educate students uh, and, and we're trying to find alternative ways to meet the needs of some students, they may benefit tremendously from an out <coughs> course that they can take outside of Scarborough High School. Mm -hmm. And they may not get the recommendation because they've been raising the devil in school or haven't been performing at, at their capacity. So that's just editorializing. I have a question uh, with regards to the cost of software versus textbooks. The way in which software is priced, it depends on the particular software. Some software that is not necessarily renewed, we license for its use, so it may be a one-time fee. Um, most software that replaces a textbook is usually a subscription. So we pay annually per student and there are volume discounts and those sorts of things and you can certainly get a discounted price if you um, contract for a six year subscription versus a one year subscription. Um, at right now those, um, it, it is less um, expensive than the cost of a textbook. Typically what happens is that publishers will sell you a bundle where you get a discounted software price um, if you purchase the textbook. Uh, in some cases we um, purchase, it depends on the grade level, we will purchase the online subscription only where we have a one-to-one -one solution for students who can take their laptops home. Right now that's seventh and eighth grade. If not, we usually need to provide some sort of print material or have the ability within the software to download that information or that assignment to be able to allow the student to take that home to be able to um, use it. Sometimes it could be just a couple pages from a text or an activity or it could be those pieces. So it is significantly less but the issue is the um, computing device and whether or not the student has access to that at home. Uh, you've used the term several times, blended learning. Mm -hmm. Would you please explain that term? Sure. Any teacher, and we currently have teachers who use uh, uh, what is technically called a learner management system, but basically it could be as simple as a website where they post their homework and they provide students with activities or videos to watch or may link into Khan Academy and ask them to do a preview of a lesson and students access that at home and do those activities at home but then come into class and work with the teacher in class, that could be considered a blended learning activity. It could also be something where a student takes an online course, could be through a college, it could be through virtual high school and yet the part of the course means that the teachers and the students come together and meet in face to face for a portion of that time, maybe three or four times over the course. And so that's called blended. But I, <laughs> and I'm wrong, I thought I heard you say that there were blended learning experiences at K2 or K3? We're looking for blended learning experiences for uh, word languages at those grade levels. Okay. And we, do, we actually do have blended learning. I mean, I see it in the classroom um, where a teacher will be um, involved and engaged with these students um, and while these, you know, five kids are cycling through certain um, uh, centers that are set up specifically and they're picking up on their program wherever they've advanced to. So, I mean, technically that is blended learning and we're, I'm very excited about blended learning and the potential that it offers to us for a much more affordable then translating to much more likely to happen because it's affordable um, um, expansion of our foreign language down into the lower grades. And there are some great, that's why uh, Monique and myself um, and actually a principal from each of the phases is um, meeting with Middlebury Integrated Language I think next week um, and we're really looking at how, how might that work for us? Because other districts have had extraordinary success where they have, for example, native speakers, not, so you're not hiring teachers, you're bringing in native speakers who are, and this is more 
uh, focused at the younger grades who are uh, practicing with a native speaker, being introduced, and then they have a subscription to Middlebury Integrated Language um, system <coughs> and they go in and get to practice that at home. So um, it, it, it offers some pretty exciting opportunities and, and as I said, other districts, uh, when I came back from the Leadership Institute I was at last year, uh, other districts had showcased some of the work that they were doing and it's amazing. They've actually created bilingual um, elementary schools where everyone is at least a second language learner, which is just very cool. Yeah. May I continue? Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm excited no, no, about no. that, Ms. <laughs> well, I get excited about that too, but I'd like to see more of it and I would like to see more crossover, especially middle school on up where we're not just focusing on literature, but the literature could include the history and the psychology and the culture and all of that business. We're, I think we're still too single focused mm -hmm. uh, when we deliver education and especially I was going to ask you about the writing. We've had been criticized for years, our lack of writing skills mm -hmm. uh, coming out of our high school. And I'm just wondering, since I hear that there are writing requirements <coughs> in various subjects at the high school, why we're not coordinating that as the writing skills in the courses where we're requiring the writing? Absolutely, and that's what we're doing. We've used our grant funds to hire an instructional coach at the high school, and that's a literacy instructional coach. And what she is in the process of doing, she just started out, is to actually do a needs assessment and work across all departments to identify what the writing needs and requirements are for each of the content areas, also for reading. But because the district focus has been on writing, she's starting with writing. And then what she's going to be developing are strategies that all teachers can use in helping students develop their writing skills for a particular content area. At the K-5, one of the um, benefits of this units of study for writing is that each of the units addresses a different genre of writing. So for example, in second grade, one of the informational writing units will be students learning how to write a lab report. That's part of the instructional writing process, not a separate science class. So that's an opportunity to integrate the writing with the sciences. Likewise, an informational unit at 3-5 uh, will involve a history research project. Um, and so, at, and certainly the middle school, middle school folks have been involved in the K-5 training. Um, and also involved in working the literacy coaches meet weekly to talk about what they're working on in terms of writing. And so they're trying to do that vertical articulation to make sure that the skills that students learn cross all content areas and are appropriate for all content areas. So we're getting there. What age do we teach students that they don't have to read every word on the page to get the concept of what's being delivered? We used to have this notion that at K, approximately K-3, students are learning to read and then they transition to reading to learn. And one of the pieces that's come out of the Common Core is we need to make that shift. They need to learn how to read ongoing and read, we call it reading strategically. So those reading strategies are very well articulated in, through that middle school framework. Those reading strategies, those instructional coaches at K-5 are going to be building those as well. In other words, what, I'm learning these technical terms coming from that. Looking at text features, for example, when you take a look at a piece of written work, what are the headings? What are the categories? What are the, you know, does it say I'm going to mention four points and you circle them so students are learning to annotate in order to be strategic about their reading. And that skill, those reading strategies, we call them reading strategies, are really how to efficiently and effectively read text, a variety of different texts. I didn't learn that until I was a sophomore in college and I taught myself. You know, I mean, it's, it's critical. Mm -hmm. For any content area. <clears throat> I've noticed that, that three through five phase, mm -hmm. my daughter was always reading sort of ahead, but she could just, re you know, she could just read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when she got to third grade, it was, okay, well, you read that, but why? You know, ask why and dig deeper and then write about what you've read by answering 
deeper questions, not just like, oh, the girl went to the store, and, you know, did this, did that, did that. But why did she go to the store? Why do you think that that happened? So you're sort of starting to really dig mm -hmm. into that mm -hmm. big time mm -hmm. in three to five. Mm -hmm. Question, Jane. Yes. Um, well, I know we beefed up the middle school uh, word language program. Um, do you so for kids who take two or three years of Drena, I think it's every kid can do up to three years of Spanish and two years of French, right? correct? In uh, middle school. school. In middle school, sixth grade is still not getting as much time as we'd like them to have. Um, they're getting it more on a specialist schedule. Once, I believe it's once or twice in a in a rotation in their rotating schedules. But seventh and eighth grade, there is more frequency with the time. It's closer to a core academic area. So I would really say that two years they're getting a significant they're getting significant instruction that will help them lead to fluency in those. So that two years will we be able to be be able to kind of reach complete like French one or Spanish French one at the one high school. That's right. So they that's don't the have goal. to retake. Oh, so they don't have to retake. You know, take that courses and go directly to two, or do they have to start from French? That's one of the pieces that the middle school teachers and the high schools are work are working on, um, because we have been growing this program and increasing the time. We're still growing those students' skills in those areas. So while students in one year may be somewhere in between at the high school, the high school teachers are working hard at getting those students where they need to be. So I, I'm not sure where we are right now with this exiting eighth grade group. I'd have to talk with the, both the middle school and the high school to see where they're going to be um, placed for next year. My understanding was it would be entry level. At this point, we aren't able to have students skip that. We just don't have sufficient staffing or um, uh, time at this point. We, because we, in the past, students were able to move forward because we had foreign language three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So they were able to move forward. Yeah, just now we're really seven, eight, and it would be unrealistic to expect them to be able to access a, a French two or Spanish two. Right. My daughter that graduated last year, she was of the th of the group where she had that opportunity, where she had it at the middle school level and back down at Wentworth, and she was able to access French two as a freshman. Mm -hmm. And then she went through and took up to French four, and then she opted out to in order to keep some other things in her schedule. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry, you had another question, yeah. Jane. Is this something related? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I don't. Is French available to seventh graders? I thought that this, that was the hope, but it didn't happen. It's only it may you not can't even choose to do anything but Spanish until eighth grade, is my understanding. I would have I to double check. I believe it's offered. French. Is I thought offered the choice was seventh. seventh. I thought I, there was I, a choice I think in seventh. Right, but I, maybe we're wrong. It's changed. It's, it's changed, it changed so much. It changed it's so much. That's what I, I but, think I be, but I believe that we have equal resources both in French and Spanish hmm. at middle school. I, I, I don't know because I know a lot, my daughters are in seventh grade this year and a lot of their friends had opted for French. And then when they got to school this year, we're told that because of the reallocation of the language teachers and to try to build right. fluency that, for that eighth grade, be, yeah. that, that it was Spanish only still for, seventh, for seventh grade. grade. I can find that out and get that information. Yeah, I just think it's tomorrow. important that people realize that not only do we not have it back to the Wentworth, but you can't do anything but Spanish. Not that there's anything wrong with Spanish or being fluent in any second language. That's not my point. But there's just no options like in other school districts until eighth grade. Kristen, do you have an opportunity for yeah. foreign yeah. language? So yeah, I took French in seventh and eighth grade, and I'm still I'm taking it. I was able to start in French too as a freshman. Okay. Now I'm an AP French this year, but I know my little brother. He's a sophomore. I think he was. He might have been year. last year. He yeah. had to start off. My year was the last year that students could have chosen to take French too as a freshman. Okay. All right. So and you're and a junior this another, year. So we right. have so another then drop. Then we had a yeah. loss then right. for all those kids below you. Right. So anyone who's a sophomore, sophomore or, below. or below has not, not will not have that not same opportunity there. as Kristen and, right. and Emma and my daughter. And I would like to ask two questions of Kristen and Emma. Number one, is this working? I think 
think it's pretty clear it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that was unequivocal. Right there. <laughs> like, think about that. Time, I think it works great, and I love. I like French is one of my favorite subjects. I love that class. And the opportunity to be able to speak another language, which in AP French, all we do, we're not allowed to talk in English in the classroom. So it's it's really cool to be able to practice that, and there's so many applications of it. But then again, I can see my little brother, who is already only two years younger than me, has been put so much behind because he hasn't had the same opportunity to take a foreign language at you know middle school. I don't know what he was like in what work, but I know at least... I don't think in seventh or sixth grade he could take Spanish, and so he had to start off kind of behind the ball. Mm -hmm. So. And what about the other curricular areas? <laughs> Numbers aren't looking too good right now. <laughs> 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 Do you compare like the middle school and the high school? It's astonishing what a difference you yeah. can drop off. That's exactly yeah. right. right. Yeah. Then, then this to my second question is more broad enough. So we have been investing in some of the few curriculum. So how long do you, you know, how do you evaluate this new curriculum? For how many years? What do you look at? And when do you think, you know, what is it working? Mm -hmm. Or <laughs> part of the, uh, this, you know, back in the day when it was, you know, every 10 years, uh, whether it was working or not, um, now what we do is we look at the student data, and one reason why we chose writing before reading, our reading data was relatively strong, so we went with writing because we knew it was weaker. And so, and the teacher saw that and wanted to move forward with writing because they knew there were improvements that needed to be made in writing. So we use the student data to guide us in terms of moving forward, but we can only move forward at the rate at which the resources are available. And we certainly make good use of the resources and as you can see and as I described last March with the student data where we have invested we've, re we've seen gains, student gains. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking forward to more student gains as more resources become available. So we talk about something like the middle school got the springboard, that sounds like springboard basically going to be a 10 year version. Not, necess not necessarily because one of the things that we look at within our cur the curriculum in making that decision is evidence of effectiveness. Is, is it show that it um, increases um, student performance, but also how frequently do they update or revise? And one of the pieces that was um, appealing to us, for example, we purchased the springboard curriculum a year or two ago and it was revised over the spring. So again, it, they are getting feedback from their teachers on what would make it better, and they're revising it. So we, because we purchased that curriculum, it doesn't mean we have to go somewhere else. It's re being revised as well. If we find that our student data shows that it's not working for us, then we would look outside um, for something else. But right now, it seems to be working quite well for us. Yeah, I would like that data right away, or in a year, or? Well, we have common assessments uh, within the curriculum. We also use our um, district-wide assessments to keep track, and we also have statewide assessments to look at our, our student performance. We certainly don't make large-scale decisions um, in curriculum areas with only one year of data, but when we start seeing three or more years of declining student performance, we start asking some questions. Um, in terms of is it the curriculum, is it um, insufficient professional development, is there something else going on here? I would like to know what these young women would suggest to us. In regard to? Curriculum. We're talking about curriculum. They want all of those zeros to become twos and all of the ones to become threes. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth. No, no. no. <laughs> but for example, last year Kristen said to us that she had difficulty getting the program of studies that she really wanted. And, and I don't know if she was able to do that this year, but uh, she's graduating. We're going to be here. We're going to continue to do the best for our students. So what suggestions might you have? I would agree with that, that it's difficult to get the schedule and take the classes that you want to take within the within the subject. Mm -hmm. um, science this year, for me, it's required that all, all the juniors take a chemistry class, and I 
think that would be more effective if everyone was able to choose what sciences they're interested in and then go from there. Hmm. Are there courses offered or curriculum that's not offered that you'd like to see offered? There's, as much as it's not, there's some good opportunities. I know like this anatomy and physiology class and the psychology class, which is a bunch of my friends that are taking and absolutely love. But it's only offered to seniors. So when you're a junior like Emma or you're a sophomore who's, you know, advanced in science or math and you're like, look, biology, mm, I kind of want to challenge myself, take this anatomy class they don't have the option to do that, so a way to, I guess, integrate it more would be a uh, give more options to everybody, not just kind of the upper class. It's so structured with your first year, so you basically have no choice except for electives in what you take, and uh, except for like with what level you take it at. But if more choice is given in what you take within the subject, I think it would be more effective and students would be more interested in learning and put more effort into their like, studies. And even then, the level you take it at is for the average student, level three and level four classes are all you can take as a freshman and a sophomore. There's obviously a few exceptions, but there's no opportunity for a student to really challenge himself and take, I don't know, AP environmental science as a freshman if they feel they're ready for that yeah, challenge. The advanced level, that's like mm -hmm. the you can't do it. Mm -hmm. So so there's a there's a very kind of disparity of which is like and even if, you know, there is a chance where you can take a class like that, there isn't kind of as much opportunity or publicity about it that, you know, coming in as a freshman I think I would have loved to challenge myself like that. But nobody ever told me I could. They were like, you can take level four of science, you can take honors, history, you can take math, and that's kind of all there is. It gives a little more information. And you need to talk to counselors. That's the counselors mm -hmm. question how, where you are. So with other um, um, course curriculum, you know, how you're doing uh, that aspect. I know that was the case. So that's the first sophomore right now is taking AP Biology, which you know, the, the teacher said, hey, we never had so many sophomores. This year I have a bunch. Well, it just happens to a bunch of kids think it, it, we want to give themselves a challenge. So I think it will just be, um, you really just have to get a permission from the you know, customer to get approval. Well, and it changes, it changes from year to year what we can actually do. Absolutely. For example, one of the reasons why it's seniors only is because we have far more students interested in the course and we don't have enough teachers to be able to offer additional sections. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, even for the courses that are currently offered and the sections that students were interested in, we didn't have enough teachers to even float those courses, let alone additional pieces. And so what happens in the scheduling process is um, the principal needs to decide in terms of which courses, there are only so many teachers, which courses are going to be offered and which courses are not going to be offered, and that sends students to find other courses, and there aren't a lot of electives to choose from, mm -hmm. um, so it becomes it becomes a challenge, and what it creates is exactly what you folks are describing, is just a very narrow, if non-existent, selection of um, courses for you. Um, there's very little choice. But this is where they can really help mm -hmm. us, I think, these young students who are on this board who can help us get to where we want to go because they're living it. Chime in, uh, you know. And if, if you have suggestions, speak with the superintendent. Speak with Monique. John has been waiting here okay. ever so patiently. Sorry, I was just going to be, you know, that's something I want to make a comment here. Is, you know, we hear this $5 million hockey Stadium, you know, it's going up in town. I feel like, you know, what the catches concerts, we those are the ones we get in our high school. If we're committed to do more in those aspects and the food of our schools, that would be so great. And I think it pays off so much more than a hockey thing. So oh, I'll have, have to disagree with that. Apples and oranges. Right. Apples and oranges, yeah, absolutely. Waiting. But that's okay. not <laughs> up for <laughs> debate <laughs> tonight. So. Right. And Chris says he's <laughs> reserving his questions for tons the end questions. because he has tons of questions. Oh, so I'm not oh, sure tons? what tons are involved. Oh, if we need like a I separate a private private meeting. If we need just oh. a private <laughs> session. All right, we'll <laughs> readjourn. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, let, we'll let Donna go ahead oh. and, and ask away. So I'm not going to ask a question. I'm 
I'm just going to make comments to, to the rest of us. Um, so we're doing a lot of good things, okay, first off, let me say. There's a lot of good professional development. We're bringing in a number of new initiatives, the new math program, the new re reading and language arts program, um, just the whole professional development piece that will be in the, um, the new evaluation program that's underway. Um, you know, grouping teachers with each other to have conversations about what they can do differently, looking into research about what is pertinent and needed in classrooms and what works to see how they can bring it forward. This is very painful stuff, but it's very real stuff for us to use in this community. Okay? We've been going out there and demonstrating how we need computers. That still is obvious here. This is really clear to me. But when I look at that category of 9 to 12, and there's six of eight content areas that are not even adequate, forget about competitive. <coughs> when these two girls go to college, and yours just showed up in Florida, there are states that have changed their agreements with universities for years now. And Florida is one of them. Mm -hmm. In the way kids sophomore year of high school have been able to take courses. Oh, yeah. uh, so that's why that's your daughter in friend. Florida is finding she. And our kids are going to find this. Every time our kids graduate from this high school, until this town and the people, the parents, the people who don't have kids in the school recognize the enormous needs we have in our high school and somewhat in our middle school. Look at that. That's pathetic. Six of eight content areas don't even meet adequate. We don't have the teachers. We're not offering the sections. We're not offering a multitude of other options for kids to pick in, the, in their elective courses. We're not offering it in, in the content areas that they're required to take. We're not going deep enough. It's just, it's so emotional for me. I'm sorry, I just can't help it. I'm just like crawling out of myself because this is what the town council needs to see when we're, go we're preparing to go to, to discussions about what's needed. This is what our community needs to hear from us. They're out there thinking, oh, you get A's. We got A's. We're in a great place. We just built a new school. We're in heaven. This is the reality that never gets exposed because we're always making it look gorgeous. We're, ma we're making it make do. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're making it make do. We're, we're covering up the real truth. Mm. We're not covering it up. It's just not being publicized, nor is mm -hmm. it being listened to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're saying it, and we've said it for five or six, the last five or six or eight years but it's not being received. The, it, it's, there's a mentality at the present time, evidently in our town, that uh, starts with dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dollar sign is over here for a school building, and the dollar sign is over here for the budget and they think because we have this beautiful new building that we're going to pay for, that they voted for, two-thirds of the voters who went out voted for it, that they shouldn't give us any more money to invest in the curriculum. So hmm. we, I don't know how we're going to change the mentality because we've been struggling with this for, for eight years now. And we keep getting on the same soapbox we're saying the same thing. We need to improve. We need more rigor. We need more teachers. And it isn't making an impact. Well, I think it, we, we've got to keep making inroads in the issue of trying to make communications, better communications with people. And that's why getting out there and getting those emails so that we can get newsletters going and maybe have more articles in the newspaper. So we're really telling what it is we need, and we're putting it out in front of people in their, in, in their inbox. 
Well, send them on. Send them on. And include this statistic. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I, I've been kind of sitting back and listening to the discussions because I'll be blatantly honest, this is not my area of expertise by any stretch of the imagination. And I've been on the, it's my, going into my third year here, and it's still almost like another language to me, to be honest with you. So um, I, 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 listening to the conversations, I, I think um, the, the, it, it, it stems back to having goals. We talked about this at our, at our goal setting. We've got to come up with a plan of where do we want to be in a year, three years, five years, and that's what we tie the dollar signs to because right now we're just seeing, people are just seeing dollars, they're just hearing dollars, they don't care what it's tied to. So I agree that we collectively, I mean, we can all, we have these discussions internally all the time, but it's like preaching to the choir because we all sit here and agree these things need to happen. But I think we've got to find a way to focus in on some areas and, and, and pick some, we can't have everything, we've got to pick two or three key issues and say, uh, let's use literacy for example. Literacy 912 is a one. We want that to be a three in three years. What's it going to cost? And then we build our argument to, you give us extra money, it's going right to the literacy line and we're going to get to a three. That's what we're going to do. I think that's how we need to do it. Well, I think that's how that's happened at the middle school over the last several but years. It needs There's been to a be concerted effort, but it needs to be said that in advance, and they need right. to know that up front. Exactly. Here's what we're looking to accomplish. Right. And, and to your point, Jackie, the definition of insanity is what? Saying the same thing for eight years <laughs> and expecting different results. <laughs> and we're still here. Well, I yeah, I know. I know. All right. So, so Jody wanted to say something over there, and I think she... No. no. Oh, no. yeah. okay. I think this is the first time we see, for us, it's some kind of quantitize what are, where our weaknesses and where our strengths. I think this, this is definitely something we want to share with our community and our parents, you know, to see these are the stuff, what do you think, and what do we need to do, and, you know, come to see <coughs> And I think the quantity, uh, uh, Monique quantitize those are very, very important. I think it's a great job to, to having that. Idea. You sure yep. you didn't have a question? <laughs> you no, I didn't. <laughs> First try. Well, well, to me to me. <laughs> I was going to piggyback on the positive that Donna was talking about. And Joanne and Dr. Amos and I this morning had a great meeting with, with business meeting, business partners mm -hmm. in this town and, and beyond, and came up with some great plans and, and moving forward with that career education. Seeing the mm -hmm. zero on career education for 9 12 blows my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but I I came out of that meeting this morning feeling really good and and knowing that, you know, we're going to look for innovative ways for kids in the high school and maybe even younger to sort of explore careers and, and get hands-on experience. So I was just going to end on a positive note, but you kept pushing me so here <laughs>
assuming nobody cares because they don't investigate, because they don't listen and respond when we're saying that foreign language is being um, decimated at all phase levels and we can't get kids to where they need to be. They mathematically cannot achieve the goal by graduation because we have made so many cuts and have not replaced it year after year. And it's not just foreign language. And so when people say, oh, you only cut things that people get emotional about, it's absurd because obviously we don't want to make any more cuts to the curriculum and so we have to cut someplace else. Well, and there's my point to that chart. Screaming from the rafters. Students in the high school are really being shortchanged, say, in science and social studies. They're Absolutely. going off to college mm -hmm. and doing mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. at a college level when they have mm -hmm. that quality of science opportunities at the high school. That's right. Kristen's been patiently waiting. I can't help but agree with this. As I'm going to be the first one to advocate for sports and athletics. I'm really actively involved in that. But And as awful as is that seventh grade sports got cut, there's ways around that. I mean, right. With the field hockey team, right. all the girls on my team go almost every day after our practice. We help we coach the seventh graders so they have the opportunity to play. Mm -hmm. There's no way around the academics Absolutely that not. if we're cutting foreign language, you can go out and buy Rosetta Stone, but it's not the same thing. You know, it's like you, you're not, you can't subsidize your own education that should be provided to you, give you the opportunity to learn when, like, you can a field hockey team. Right. And it's just, it's not right that people don't know or understand or seem to care that the education is being sacrificed. When do you turn 18, Kristen? My next name. June. Okay. Well, <laughs> <for a while. laughs> next, June, next June, Kristen, I would fully expect that you would be going to register yourself to vote. And when the time comes for all these things, you tell all your friends, these are the things we missed out. Maybe we'd like to help out the younger kids and give them this opportunity that we missed out on. You know, I just one more thing because Kristen brought it up and it needs to be said. The varsity field hockey team has been fantastic in as a replacement coaches. I mean, better than a regular season would have been had the, the varsity team has provided for the seventh grade girls. So thank, thank you. you for that. I, I, I think you. that's that's awesome too. But I, I, I'm hesitant. I, I'm hoping that's not the model moving well, forward. Okay, I don't, I don't want to give them so. I don't want it to be such. A, I'm no. wonderful. It's a positive experience, but it's a positive experience because of individuals, not Absolutely. because of the structure we've created. And, and the parents have, right. have yeah. all agreed that this can't be a sustainable model. This right. happens to be a unique freak thing, but they have stepped up yeah. where there was a loss, and so that's very, very impressive. Now, Danny, a three-year improvement plan. You said it was like curriculum three years improvement ago, <laughs> because I think the curriculum needs to be faster than that. All right, mm -hmm. Mr. Chiazzo, because I've seen no other hands up at the other. Yeah. Side. So I'm now in the precarious position of a apologizing because I have questions and everybody's no. often, and b um, I'm hoping these aren't uh, these are more for my benefit, just to kind of get me up to speed. Okay. So the, don't take any of these as criticism or anything, please. It's just for me to understand better Certainly. because when we do get out in the community, I'd like to be able to speak semi-intelligently sure. about this stuff. Okay. Um, the first question, you, you talked about the online programming and shifting to those types of resources. How do we currently facilitate that at the high school if we do not have one-to-one -one computing and we don't have access to that technology? How do we facilitate that now? Uh, we have been able to uh, infuse the high school with carts of laptops and some departments have access to that. So when they have activities that require online experiences, they hand out the laptops to the students in certain classes. But I guess maybe, Kristen, you could probably go. Have you taken some online classes as well? Have you done anything? Nothing. No, you haven't done anything online. I personally okay. haven't done anything online, but, okay. you know, and I know in chemistry a lot we'll use the laptops to, you know, make data tables and stuff like that. But um, it's weird that classes like chemistry don't have it, but then I go to English class and we rarely have a laptop to write on. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, so I'm just wondering how much personal computers are used for online classes and that kind of the classes and that kind of stuff. But that that helps me understand the the needs for the one to one and how that's mm -hmm. going to impact the curriculum side of things. Um, the early college for me on the on the um, curric uh, the community college side. Mm -hmm. Do we do anything with the Vogue students for that? Because to me, I, I'm making that connection that that might be a a, a real connection for them moving Absolutely. into. Absolutely, it's, it's available to all students. 
But, but I but think again, with, with them being off-site at Westbrook in the past, do we do we deal directly with them, or do we rely on the past and the vote people to interface with those programs for them? They have a guidance counselor right here. Okay. Um, so they would work through the guidance counselor here if they wish to access college coursework here. Okay. And they aren't there all day. They leave midday uh, around 11-ish or so. Um, but then come back to the high school. So depending on their transportation needs, they could access courses at the community college. I know that Westbrook and Pass both offer the students um, after places. They do. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah. Can take and we're that looking. And they can take that before, um, you know, while they're at Pass or Westbrook. And we're looking um, at off being able to offer AccuPlacer to students here at the high school as well. Okay. Um, and I, I may have my terminology off, so please bear with me for a second. Um, Jackie Pro uh, mentioned this a little bit. Is there, is there a focus any longer with the, the crossover? Because I remember when I first, last year, we were putting a lot of emphasis on the crossover teaching with doing the math in the science class and the English in the math and that kind of stuff. And I didn't hear a whole lot of that here today. So is that still an area of focus, or are we having to, because of resources, shift things around? And uh, the um, middle school, because of its reorganization, has been able to, um, and the schedule change and the uh, piece there, they have been able to find that common planning time for their teachers, and because they're organized on those learning communities with inquiry teams, those teachers have the opportunity to get together and offer students those opportunities. They are developing those offer opportunities. Uh, there are a number of different activities. Every time I'm in the middle school, there's a new one. There's uh, the Lunder Grant, where teachers are working on those pieces. Um, there are um, activities. We have made connections, uh, Eco of Maine, for some of the science pieces. So teachers are able to make those connections. Um, as we looked at um, the social studies curriculum at the middle school, we also, part of it were opportunities for connections with other disciplines, specifically connecting with the units that the English language arts are going to be teaching. So we're starting to make those connections at the middle school. And I've got to say that the reorganization there, the schedule allowing teachers time to come together to do that, has allowed that to happen at the high school. Um, if you recall, several years ago there was a freshman team in which those teachers had the time to get together and work together, um, and specifically they worked on common reading strategies and activities, but because of um, the uh, schedule, we're no longer able to offer that to teachers. So it, it is, other than in a couple individual situations where teachers are next door to each other and happen to have the same group of students, it, it, it doesn't happen at the high school. And, and part of that is the time to plan those units in order to do them well and find those connections across the curriculum. So is it fair to say that it's not that it's not a focus anymore, it's just the attention is needed or the scheduling conflicts, it, it doesn't allow us the opportunity to do that? Absolutely. Um, a, as a matter of fact, one of the research-based practices that show the most promise is what we call problem-based learning which is that authentic, relevant uh, kind of learning experience where students have a challenge question and we work them through um, the process where there may be an algebra teacher as well as social studies working together. Um, it's the schedule that really um, gets in the way of that. Okay. And, that's the re and that's the reason why in the center of, of the continuum there's been a redesign even in terms of how the schools are organized. And so they, they are positioned, both three, well, three through eight is better positioned at this point to, because of the, because of the way that the schedule runs and beca because of the groupings, that organizational piece now better facilitates that work. The other, and uh, um, of course, K2 is very cross content in general, and 912 is where traditionally, their people kind of stick to their own, sort of like when I was in high school. Um, I think that the interesting piece across the district is with the professional learning teams now starting with a focus on what do I need to do, what do my students need me to get better at, in other words, the professional learning goal. What we're seeing in our PLTs are 
two math teachers working with two science teachers and, and, a, and an art teacher. And, and so they've come together more in terms of their professional learning, which is a great, at least a great first step to be, to be a, a little bit more multidisciplinary or multi-content focused um, in, their, in their approach or, or getting a little more used to that as an orientation. So that, that's a, and that has, I think that we both, Monique and I were out sort of, uh, and as were some of the, the other um, central office folks, out and about with the PLTs, and, and it's just amazing how cross content the groups are this year because we, we've really emphasized the professional learning piece. So it, it, and it, it sounds like, and I know this isn't a curriculum discussion per se, but it sounds like scheduling is our biggest obstacle at the high school to implement a lot of these changes that we're trying to do. Is that a fair assessment? Yes, but I, I understand yeah. that when you shift the schedule, <coughs> um, it, it has impact in terms of staffing. Of course. Um, right, but so we've got to focus on what to fix. It sounds to me the recurrent theme that I keep hearing is scheduling, scheduling, that they're, they're the classes aren't available, we don't have the right teachers to teach it, we only available at certain times, restricted class scheduling. Exactly right. And I know, absolutely. I know we're working Mr. Rich was, was yep. that's a focus yep. of his as well. So. Yes, absolutely. All right. But well, Chris, um, if you don't have the teachers, it doesn't matter what you do to the schedule. I, no, that's clear. I, that's clear. So they but kind of both go hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. But that's part of our uh, prioritization of needs to say, Correct. The schedule is an issue. We need to correct the schedule. To do that, we need more language teachers. We need more, you know, something. <laughs> and then we can tie that tangible. I, I like your approach. I really do. And we've not tried that. And I think it's something we really should should uh, run with. Well, and it's why it's why the middle school this this last budget cycle was really positioned to make those organizational changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why those were for, from the team, from the entire K-12 team, that was prioritized because they were ready to go. And it's really, and we talked about K-2 really looking more at um, best practices, you know, outside of Maine, and 9-12 really looking at the structural changes that need to happen because we are basically being, or the students are basically being kept kept captive by that schedule because a change in schedule would drive a fairly significant bump in the kind of resources. We are, the, the, it's a perfect walk right now. We have this amount of resources and this schedule works. And, and you hear from the students how that locks and them it's down. Right. And it does, right, and it holds them. And you kind of see where, we, where other places have gone and where we have stayed. So I, I think you get it. Yeah, and I think that well, then that becomes an area of focus for it's the a, next it's slide. A, yeah. It's a huge mm -hmm. focus for right. all of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, my vernacular may be off a little bit, but we've talked in the past about um, having, I don't want to say integrated instruction, but the K through 12 model of having what are the skill sets coming out of K2 going in, what does 3-5 need to, for K2 to get, mm -hmm. and having that discussion back when I didn't hear anything of that in this. And I'm just wondering where we're at with that process. I know it's ongoing, and I know we have um, district-wide um, content coaches or whatever they're, the, the instructional. instructional coaches, I'm sorry. Um, how are we doing with that? Uh, certainly in the area of literacy and mathematics, we're probably in the best shape, and that's a result of having those instructional coaches working together. Actually, I'm meeting with uh, them tomorrow morning um, working on some of those pieces. Uh, in the other content areas, um, we're in a lot better shape than we were um, five years ago. Um, there's always more work to be done in those areas, uh, especially if we start talking about some changes at the middle school. We need to share those with um, the other phase levels. Uh, so quite a bit of the work is really relationship building across phase levels. And that, um, I've been very impressed with our leadership um, encouraging those opportunities um, to come together and the time to do so as well. So it, it, is there a way to tie that? Obviously, it's always a way to tie it into resources, but let's say we're, if we're leaning more towards, we now have one-to-one -one computing, in essence, from three through eight, mm -hmm. correct? Correct. Yep. So we're developing skill sets and, and learning strategies three through eight, and once they walk out of the middle school into the high school, it stops. That's right. Absolutely. Yep. So yes. 
-hmm. That's a fair assessment. I mean, it, does, it doesn't stop no, no, necessarily. I, right. But, but I mean, that's well, it, it, it certainly it's uh, slows down yes, or, yeah, yeah. or it's a all those skill sets drop. now need to be readjusted because what they've learned three through eight in terms of the learning process, the interactive electronic learning, mm -hmm. doesn't exist any longer at or doesn't exist to the extent it did maybe as a fair It's not supported at the high school. Right. right. Okay. Uh, absolutely. For example, I'm going to be working with the technology integrators, which we have um, a, a part-time person at K2. We have a full-time at 3.5 and at, also at middle school, but we don't have a technology integrator who has, who would have a sense of all curriculum areas mm -hmm. to be able to see how we could effectively use technology across content areas, but also those technology skills themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, all students are required to take a technology for the 21st century course. We're also look at the high school. Um, we're also looking at how that might better be delivered to meet individual student needs because they're in a range of different places in terms of their technology skills. But also, does that have to be a required course mm -hmm. typically in that freshman year, which takes up valuable time during the day. We're looking at maybe shifting that, making that look a little bit different. That would free up also a teacher to be able to offer additional courses in that area. Why, uh, let me interject here and ask a question. Why would we have to be teaching students how to use the technology as freshmen when they've been exposed to it from the time they were in third grade? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense to me, Monique. But, well, there are technology skills that students at the high school also need to know, and it's really a refinement of the skills, and it builds upon those skills that they learn at middle school. For example, there are some research skills that you need to know in technology or um, in terms of evaluating information, being a critical consumer of information. That looks different. Uh, those skills look different at the middle school than they would at the high school just by the very nature of the type of information students are accessing and how they're accessing it. The databases are more complex that the students are exposed to at the high school than they are at the middle school. Also, their technology skills, for example, just using an Excel spreadsheet. The nature of the curriculum at the middle school, they may be using certain functions within that application at the middle school, but certainly in high school, when you're starting to dump huge data sets and multiple data sets into Excel, there's a different level of expertise you might need at the high school rather than the middle school. But, but why would they need a, a course, a full course, to teach those skills? Why would they not learn those skills uh, while they're in the course of study where they're having to use well, because I think I personally think it would take a, you do need a separate class to learn how to integrate the Excel spreadsheet. Otherwise, you'd spend your entire biology lab or chemistry lab learning how to do the data on the computer. And, and what we really want to do is customize it yeah. for the students. Pardon me? We really want to do is be able to customize that for the students. There are some students may want to go off and, and learn okay. coding. Okay. There may be other I'm, students I'm may want to go off and learn it. web design. There's not a reason not to have the technology. Kristen yeah. has a question. Um, um, comment. I was just going to say, I know I had rarely or not in depth used Excel until chemistry this year, and we have our little laptops in the class while we're doing our lab, and if we have a question, we'll be like, hey, Mr. Keller, I don't get this, and he'll come over and explain it and be like, oh, you know, hit the equal sign, box, box, good, you'll get your inverse data, here's how you plug it into a graph. And it's, we have enough time in the classroom as part of that learning experience it's part of the learning experience is the technology and how to use technology and apply it to chemistry. So I, I guess I kind of don't see that technology in the 21st. I never had that class that wasn't, I got grandfathered and did not have to take that. I did get yeah, that class and honestly, if I'm being, I'm being honest here, I did not get out of it, I think, what was desired. Because mm -hmm. I learned more about search engines, what to use for databases in English classes when we were doing research papers. I've learned more about Excel this year in chemistry than I did. I feel like, honestly, freshman year taking technology in the 21st century, it was a lot of setting up email accounts that everyone already had, setting up. That's good feedback. Absolutely, and, and that's what we're having discussions about in terms of our technology curriculum, in terms of what might better meet students' needs. Um, because it may, it may not be a one-size-fits-all course. Yes, so that's exactly my, my yep. experience with that. I mean, yep. he really thought that 
class was just, you know, it's required, you cannot even skip that class. Mm -hmm. And it was, he almost planned to do a petition in eighth grade to try to get, you know, permission not to have that class. Yeah. I told him, no, don't make trouble there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just take it, just, you know, you don't need as much time, but take one period of his class, you know, time, that he misses out the opportunities. I really think that yep. you know, for some kids who have been using computers for you know for so many years, the yep. that cost is really not <laughs> much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we're looking at no. shifting that in a way that that proficiency, those proficiencies, no. be articulated so students know what they need to do before they graduate. So if they achieve that in middle school, it gets checked off. If it happens in chemistry, it gets checked off. Right. If it happens in so English, it in terms of demonstrating citizen, digital citizenship, it right. can get checked off. So moving towards that student center, that proficiency base, it may not need to be a separate course. Okay, that's great. Chris has informed me that he has just Three questions left. Three. Three. <laughs> three. three questions <laughs> each Chris. has 15 subparts. Okay. So I'll go <laughs> awesome. Exactly. I move we adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> said that twice already. Um, uh, science. There, we didn't talk about STEM. There was no mention of STEM at all in the update. Is that still a focus? Are we still there? Uh, 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 STEM is. Um, it, it's not. It, it often gets translated to be pre-engineering and engineering. STEM is really every area of science, mathematics. It's also engineering. It's also technology. Uh, so we do have a range of offerings. Uh, the additional coursework, um, as I mentioned, in under that science area is sort of that wave technology piece, information technologies, but also engineering and pre-engineering. Uh, no, we don't offer enough. Uh, for example, we've just opened the Wentworth School with those STEM labs. Um, we're talking, working with the technology integrator and some interested classroom teachers on how we might use those labs, and we're working on developing that curriculum for that, but that may well need some um, additional support in terms of staffing to either teach the classroom teachers how to use that lab and deliver that curriculum, or it may be a specialist um, that delivers that instruction. Um, and that's just 3-5. Um, at the middle school, we have um, the engineering piece um, in the um, design tech courses that we offer at the middle school. But again, at the high school, it's, again, that, that cliff. We just don't offer anything in that pre-engineering area. Uh, community services. We didn't hear anything about that. Community service, not community services. I'm sorry. Uh, community, community service. Community service um, as, as a yep. way of, um, you know, community involvement or engagement or something. I'm sure. Um, commun we're looking really at service learning mm -hmm. versus um, community mm -hmm. service. Okay. Community service is really where students go out and volunteer their time. Service learning is where students go out, volunteer their time. There's an academic component to that uh, where students can receive academic credit. It may be a, um, a project that has science application, maybe a recycling project. You know, so we're looking at those opportunities, uh, but again, it is um, a curriculum development piece as well. Part of the graduation requirements that focus on those guiding principles, that's a piece that I'd like to see um, in there as a possible um, uh, body of evidence that students could provide to show that they are an engaged citizen. Um, yeah, we could use them to get out the vote campaign. <laughs> okay, Mr. Fresh, Mr. Fresh, your last question. Yes, um, uh, I really like this chart, and I really want to use this chart, but I have one question. Is the data that was used to score those subjective or objective? Uh, I would call it um, professionally subjective. Okay. I mean, it, it's, it's my... Person. Professional judgment, it okay. is my view of where we are in terms of a curriculum assessment. Yep. I, I would, the piece here for me is, I, my worry is that this gets interpreted as quality of teaching. It's not right. quality of teaching. We have folks working very hard, learning, um, becoming better teachers, taking advantage of that professional time. Uh, and really working hard to maximize resources, like I described in this area of science. We have, um, it, it's the materials piece. It is also the opportunity for teachers to come together to work with each other. For example, in 
international um, schools. Very often one of the differences is when teachers aren't in class teaching, they spend their time outside, which is a significant portion, more time than we offer teachers outside um, their work day, yeah. to work on becoming better teachers and to design quality instructional units. Um, that's what we've been trying to build in that middle school shift mm -hmm. to provide more time for that to happen. Uh, and so I, I, and I think I see all our teachers trying to do that with the time they have outside that day. So if you came forward and asked me if we extended the school day, I'm not sure it would be for students. I think we would really want to take a look at how we, we might extend that day for more time for teachers to work together. Uh, as part of their work day? Uh, I, well, I, and I, I fairly confidently, I think, speak for everybody here, ultimately respect your professional subjectivity <laughs> and, and agree with it 100%. I think to be really effective and helpful in the community, if we could find a way to tie that into whether it's curriculum t uh, 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 testing um, scores or mm -hmm. find a tangible mm -hmm. way like that we can that we can convey that very message, because sure. I'm sure it's accurate, but, uh, but something that we can look at that's, that's very objective, whether it's, like I said, test scores or something to say, guys, this really is the area we need to focus on, and then we can use that to develop our, our uh, plan or our, our pitch to the community. There's certainly student performance data, but there's also some um, data in terms of just uh, the sheer um, shelf life of some of our materials in terms of copyright dates, uh, those pieces. Um, I, I think provide that, that information. Yeah, that but that's data. That, that objective yeah. data that, yep. that ties into the reason of that 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 professional interpretation. We can. T I mean, I think it's a great chart. We can show it and say this is what our this is what our our team thinks. This is why they mm -hmm. think that, mm -hmm. and this is why we need the resources to to focus in this area. Yeah. The other piece of the conversation, and I'm not sure. Um, how this gets communicated, this is something I've struggled with over time, is that people who went through school, like me, have certain uh, image based on their experience of what school is and ought to be and was. And that picture has changed. Uh, and um, educating folks as to what school looks like now, and if we're educating students for today, we're not doing our job. We need to educate students for the future. So what school looks like if we're really preparing students well for the future is very different than what school looked like for us. And how to communicate that to the community and the cost associated with that is a challenge. Okay, it's it's a significant to challenge. Mind, can you take that one step further? The way school looks today for our students looks different than it looked for us, but if you even go back one step further, the school that we all attended looks very different than what our parents or grandparents attended. Right. So we need to keep in mind that it's not just one step, it has evolved over 50 years. Things have changed along the way. And we all need to sort of keep that in mind as we are preparing these kids for the future. You know, things are completely different than they were 20 years ago, which were totally different than they were 20 years before. For a, a simple example, a very simple example is that as um, some of us were going to school, we were preparing for a career. Mm -hmm. um, that's not the case now. Mm -hmm. These students will have 11 different careers. In the, yeah. Careers, not jobs, right. careers. That's what the data is telling us at this point in time. And so that's a very different set of knowledge and skills that students are going to need moving forward than we need it. I, I think that's, that, again, depending on an individual's background, uh, there are many um, parallels and examples we can draw. It's easy for me to draw that, that example of being in a technical field. I can say I'm not using the same laptop. I get new laptops every two years. Why do I get a new laptop every two years? It's not because that uh, the laptop is, doesn't function anymore. It's because software updates come. I need more processing power. I need it to do other things. So I think we can find the right hot buttons with the community once we determine what the hot buttons need to, where the focus needs to be. That's a great visual to say we've identified 912 is the next focus. 
curriculum in the 912 is the next focus. Now let's gather up some, some, um, some, some existing data. We can do comparisons to, um, you know, we can maybe even solicit uh, U d data from the university system to say, um, what, are you, what are your expectations now for incoming freshmen? Mm -hmm. Pull up from, not just from UMaine, if they're, you know, whatever. We can say, sure. you know, we're not saying this. This is what the universities are telling us. These are their expectations for incoming freshmen. Just in the front page of the Press Herald this week, it said that because of the way the state is funding education, Education costs for communities have gone up with 37 percent, and they were complaining in Scarborough that they went up 24 percent. But statewide, it's, I think it was, th I kept that, I have that statistic, but... Uh, yeah, but Jackie, you know the response. We live in Scarborough, we don't live everywhere else. Oh, okay. hey, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to go on a kind of, go back to what uh, Chris was saying about this, you know, objective and subjective this of these two things. I know um, you, even though they're professional subjective, you must come together and make those decisions based on some objective yes. criteria. Yes, information, absolutely. Yes, you can give us is what you think, why do you think, you know, mm -hmm. this is, uh, uh, instead of the great, you know, uh, the, the assessments, because that's ties into the performance of a large variety of areas, um, but what do you think this program should look like? What kind of area schools they for a literacy program they have, we don't have, what we have? Mm -hmm. So those kind of information, they, you know, by uh, correct them, you know, by each uh, subjective mm -hmm. area, we will see, okay, what we need to do in the next uh, budget cycle, what, you know, where do we choose, you know, to emphasize on. That would be great. And I, I, I'll, I'll leave my comments to the last challenge. This board has to come up with those sooner rather than later. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because we need to be proactive. We need to pick our battles. We need to frame those arguments You're right. now, yep. not yep. in November when we're getting ready to start looking at numbers. Absolutely. February. When you're looking at it. I look in November. I tell you in February. Oh, <laughs> that's how that works. Thank you. I guess I must not be sitting in at those meetings for <laughs> yeah, right. hours. Yeah. Okay. So, seeing no other questions, uh, will okay. we adjourn? Thank, Thank you. you. Do I have a second? All in favor of adjourning this meeting this evening, 7 and 2. Thank you so much for your presentation. We will appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you so much no, for your support. No, no, no.